separated the individual from the collective a long time ago. We got a great personal freedom. That was kind of the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. And in doing so, we can see individuals drift away from the constraints of community and culture. Bienvenue and welcome to Cirque du Sound, a sonic trip brought to you by Cirque du Soleil where we redefine the boundaries of creativity with some of today's most forward thinkers, doers, and creators. My name is Michel Aprise. I'm the creative guide of Cirque du Soleil. At Cirque du Soleil, our special skill is recognizing good creative ideas in all their disguises. We know that creativity can come from anywhere. Right now, in the background, you're hearing the spellbinding music of Ka, composed by our friend René Dupéry. Kai is a very special Cirque du Soleil show that tells the story of imperial twins who are separated at the prime of their youth and must undergo a rite of passage of self-discovery. The show is about their encounters with Ka. What is Ka? Ka is the fire that has the dual power to destroy or illuminate. This idea of the rite of passage is incredibly powerful. It's everywhere. You find it across all cultures throughout history and right up to contemporary times, part of the hero's journey. Journeys in the desert, difficult hunting challenges, psychedelic experiences, these kinds of things come to mind. But also more mundane things like your first haircut, your first paycheck, the first time you ask a girl or a guy out. And if you think about it, you can probably name a rite of passage in your own life. For me, it was my, my first day at SIP. You know, I was a freelance director. It was my first time on the payroll somewhere. I kind of felt on that day that something profound was changing in my life. And it was all about connecting to the community of artists and staff members at SIP. So I had found my family. Rites of passage help us mark time and significant events. They also galvanize creativity, encourage innovation and experimentation, and drive us forward. So how do they do this? That's what we're going to talk about today. Way Davis, welcome to Cirque du Sound. Wonderful to be with you, Michel. It's so great. People have to know that we work together on a show here called Septimo Dia No Descansare, uh, based on the musical and cultural legacy of a band from Buenos Aires. And um, for that show, we had created a whole world. And uh, I, I extend, um, I ask Wade to look at the world that we were, we had actually created a planet with this civilization based on the music, the lyrics uh, of the band. And So there I was with Wade Davis asking him, like, does it make sense, that civilization and the conversations we had and all the, the references you sent me about the origin of rock was so, so helpful. And I, had such a, I, I didn't know we'd be doing this today. And so it's a big honor and, and huge pleasure for me. Oh, well, you know, Michel, that was such a fun thing to do together. But it's kind of interesting because what you asked me to do was to kind of envision what would a world informed only by Soda Stereo, all the reference to that band and their music, their passion, what would it look like? And what we were really doing is constructing any world, because one of the fascinating things about anthropology is even though um, in terms of human justice and human rights, we always are speaking about the fact that every culture's got something to say, each deserves to be heard, there's no hierarchy in the affairs of culture, every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question, what does it mean to be human and alive, and so on. At the same time, what draws us together is not just a common history that's written in our bones, um, the fact that we're all children of Africa, including those of us us who walked out of the ancient continent some 65,000 years ago, but we also all face the same adaptive imperatives. And that, of course, is what 
passage rites are part of. You know, we all have to give birth to children. We have to find ways to couple, to come together, man and woman, to procreate. And they can be different kinds of rules and consistent within each culture, but everybody's got to deal with that in the same sense that everybody's got to deal with ch children becoming adults, and we have to deal with the agony of growing old, the, the mystery of death. So, you know, the fascinating thing is that every culture, by definition, faces the same challenges, the same adaptive imperatives. And the poetry of it is, is the fact that so many different answers to that question, you know, so many different options have been discovered. But when we really get down to it, every culture has to feed their children, educate their children, and, of course, deal with the, the transformation of a child into an adult. I mean, Blake called it the journey from innocence to experience. Biologically, we identify it as puberty. When a woman, a girl, has her first menses, when a boy first reaches puberty. And, and these transitions are marked in every single culture in very formal ways, in ritualistic ways, with the possible exception of our own, where the only kind of passage rites we have, we kind of identify as you sort of did in your intro, you know, your first haircut, your first car, your first date. And we, in this culture, in the West, we call those years the teenager years, because it's the years in between. And the reason teenage years are so fraught and challenging for young people in our society, I suspect, is precisely because we don't really have formal rituals that um, send the message loud and clear that, hmm. that you know life as a child is over, adulthood has begun. That's so important. You're right. Just for the listeners here, how would you define broadly rite of passage itself? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, it, it really was originally a French. Uh, phrase, read du passage. And it was the idea that it is a transition in terms of growing up from infants, from birth, infancy, childhood, young adulthood, adulthood, householder phase, elderly years, death. All of these passages are passages of life, life to death. And the one that is so absolutely critical because it's not about the individual, it's about the collective, it's about the community, is the passage right that transforms a child into a young adult. And the reason that is so important, I mean, we know that every culture reveres their children and we protect them with everything we have for all of their lives and all of the time that they are with us as infants. So then you have to ask the obvious question, why then, if we've been so protected, of them, do we suddenly, almost universally, expose them to such ordeals, such pain in some cases, such challenges that mark the transition which you would call the rite of passage, the coming of age, the transition that is ritualistically acknowledged by the societies? And the answer for that is very simple. The message has to be clear. Childhood is over. You are now as we age and you replace us, coming at us from below, the entire fate of our people is now in your hands. And so that's why I think, Michelle, we see so many dramatic, almost ordeal-like initiations. You know, in, in New Guinea, for example, in the Sepik River, literally scarification, which transforms the skin of a child into that of a crocodile, a sacred being, or in the Amazon where individuals have to sort of put their hands into baskets of incredibly terrible ants, one bite of which can swell up and freeze your arm for a week, and you have to endure scores of those bites. So these things just pile one atop the wow. other in this amazing weave that we call culture. It's amazing. And I, I was listening to you and I was thinking about our very urban society. And because when, when you spoke about like the teenagers, I was thinking about my older brother and sister, the way that they got in trouble so much when they were teenagers. And I'm wondering if, if it's not because we need to get to those rites of passage, those painful, that, that facing the danger 
And if, if it's not provided to us, like my parents were protecting them. And so at night they would get in trouble and use the car and speed on the boulevard, risking their lives, climbing on, on bridges and stuff. And, and I always wondered why they went to this uh, well, meeting I, of the I, danger. I, I mean, I think, and yeah. so they're giving themselves the, 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 the rites of passage that, they were not, that were not provided by the parents, no? Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you, you've, Michelle, you're always, it's, it's so funny because you, you're such an artist, um, but you think in ways of almost like an anthropologist because you're always so spot on. And what you, two things just jump out of what you just mentioned. One is that in our society, you know, we liberated the individual from the collective a long time ago. We got great personal freedom, but that was kind of the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. And in doing so, we cast the individual adrift away from the constraints of community and, and, and culture even. And, of course, most societies, um, the community still counts for more than the individual because without the strength of the community, the individual would not have the support upon which his life or her life might be necessary. So part of this is that, in general, we have lost a sense of community. We, we think it's completely normal that our aunts live in Florida and our grandparents are in California and we live in Montreal and, you know, we're scattered all over the world. Well, that's kind of a, not a new thing. You know, my, like your older brother and sister, I had this um, really wild stepsister who basically, you know, uh, made James Dean look like a folk angel, you know. And, uh, and yet I think a lot of that was just acting out and having no one to kind of, uh, to kind of, um, in a way, contain through ritual, through attention, through um, community um, uh, priorities, the kind of the surge of hormones and energy that, of course, by defin physio definition, physiologically um, uh, marks that transition as much as a, a chronological or a societal transition it is. So, you know, trying to figure out ways to... Um, capture that power and release it in societally uh, helpful ways to the society, that's what these passage rites are often about. It's funny because I always say that in our society, North American one, and I know it's very diverse, uh, uh, but in some parts of it, like the one I belong to, uh, the, we ignore death. And this is why our thing our life are not as, as intense as they, they could be. But you just made me realize that we ignore that so important passage from childhood to the adulthood, and it's so. I, and I love to. In the past, I work with with classes uh, of teenagers and like uh, workshops for, for drama and stuff. And I was always, always amazed by the the energy that they have. And I love the attitude that want to change the world. And, and I always thought, okay, we don't, we, we don't. Um, uh, 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 leverage that and it's just we, we park them in high schools and we just nag at them and you know, I, I adore teenagers and to sit down with them and hear them philosophy and, and stuff and, but we completely we, we don't get it we, we, we just ignore I mean if you think back artistically you know um, uh, one can argue that those teenage years uh, are almost the peak of a human being's creativity. You know, um, um, you know. Hmm. I think of the, I think of the Beatles getting together at such an early age. You know, they're so typical of 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 that creativity. And I I, I remember, you know, I I can remember being very self possessed and aware of the world and thoughtful of the world at a remarkably early age. And I absolutely um, felt that. Uh, I was on my own, uh, perhaps with some support from some friends, but um, certainly in, in the, the common high school experience is one of isolation, I think, and alienation to, to, to a certain extent. And again, it's partly because we don't, we're, we, you know, we're, we're trying, don't forget, what is school all about? School's not just about the transmission of skills and knowledge, it's also about the socialization of the individual into the collective. Yeah. And that's why we have such a, a powerful sense of the normative, you know, how we, we define um, um, a kind of norm that we're comfortable with. And any student, any child who doesn't fit that norm, whether they've 
um, they're restless or creative or visual as opposed to, you know, we suddenly almost create these categories to label them as deviant, whether it's, you know, attention deficit syndrome or all these labels we put on kids when, in fact, they may be just... um, um, you know, in, in this kind of burst of creativity, I always certainly remember that the most interesting um, kids I knew when I was that age were the oddballs. It's funny because to me, I, I I know that as artists, people get the calling a little bit early, but the real decision happens when you're fourteen, fifteen, and it, it, I I realized that once I was working on a movie and. Uh, uh, the best F special effect guy in Montreal that all the American and Canadian uh, and Quebec uh, produce, producers were hiring. It was like the Mozart. He started pretty early. And he was so, so good. And he, his task for the movie was to make a replica of my arm. And he was so good. And I I, I instantly asked him, like, oh, I'm sure that you, your mother was, uh, was mad at you when you were 15 because you were putting things in the dryer in the basement and things were flaming and stuff. He said, oh, did you speak to my mother? And ever since then, when I work with the designer, I ask, tell me about your life at 15. And you, you would not be surprised because you know about that, that the essence of the designers are all there. The way they drew, why they did it, they made the little shows. It, it was at 14, 15. To me, when I deal with a designer, I often picture, okay, he or she is 15, and this is where we relate so well, and especially at Cirque du Soleil, because there's an embracement of freedom. There's, we don't look for conventional. We want to make sure, because I, I realized recently I'm, I'm thinking a lot about Cirque, and we're very inclusive, even uh, uh, in a neurological, neuro, neurological way, and, and I found out one of the reasons why I love this company is because we embrace those elements of their personality. If you want to be a juggler, you've got to be Asperger or something like that. Because mm-hmm. if you're at the level that we hire, you need to do it at least four hours a day. That's apart from the show. So if you're like normal and beige, you, you know, you cannot do that. You have to well, have that little thing. So, Well, Michelle, you've always had that. Ever since I first, you know, was in touch with you, there was a boy-like quality that I don't think you've ever lost, which is something I find so endearing and why I like to um, do anything I'm ever poss- I, anything I ever can with you. It's so much fun, you know. But I think those, you know, those early years, like when I was 14, my mother, who was a, a simple but determined Canadian woman, had told me that Spanish was the language of the future, and she worked all year as a secretary in an elementary school to raise enough money to allow me to join a, a, a small group of boys that a, a language teacher was taking to Colombia. And mm-hmm. it was an extraordinary experience because a lot of the older, um, I, I was like at 14, the youngest, and many of the other lads on the trip were 16 or, or, or even older, and many of them succumbed to what the Colombians call mamitis or homesickness. And I f- honestly felt quite the opposite, uh, as if I had finally found my home. And I, I just rambled around Columbia on my own, and so much, I felt such freedom. And of course, that that, that kind of was um, foreshadowed what my life would be. And Absolutely. by the same token, I remember when I moved from Montreal to the West Coast, and my parents put me in a boarding school, for two, and I was there for a year, and it was a hideous experience. The prefects were absolutely uh, fascist and cruel and vicious and yeah. so on. And that summer, the, the headmaster called me up. I'd only been there one year, and he asked me if I wanted to be the head prefect. And I somehow, at the age of, I, I was still 15 or 16, I had the audacity to say to him, I'll accept your invitation on one condition, that on the first day of term, I can speak to the entire school without any teachers present. And he said, okay. And I literally, at the age of 16, how did I do this? I announced a revolution. And I said, we're going to transform this place. There'll be no more rules like this, no more violence, no more cruelty, no more bullying, and so on. Well, of course, I was like Kerensky, and the whole thing fell apart in the chaos of a Lenin-like revolution. But the point is that, you know, (laughs) the, the impulse to stand up for justice or to speak your mind or to not give a damn... You can look back in a teenage, and it's all forged in that in it's that time. There. It's all there. 
just a quick reminder, you're listening to Cirque du Sound, a brand new podcast from Cirque du Soleil, looking at the interdisciplinary roots of creativity. Fans go first. Whether it's early access to seasonal deals or pre-sales, pick your tickets before everybody else. Sign up for Club Cirque today and you'll be the first to hear about access to special events, pre-sales and discounts. Take a look behind the curtain and enjoy up-to-date news on all things Cirque du Soleil, including shows, artists and latest innovations. Visit CirqueDuSoleil.com to subscribe. I have, I have a question for you. If, you. if you think of our lives as a story, what part is played by the writ of passage? You kind of answered that already, but I'd like you to elaborate. And the, does it encourage the, the conformity and the sense uh, of belonging? I'd like well, to yeah, that. I mean, I think, I think, you know, one of the... I mean, I mean, this is a big kind of conundrum between... <laughs> um, the celebration of the individual or the power of the community. I mean, it, it's not like one's – none of us, I don't think, would want to go back, those of us raised in the West, to a world where we are absolutely confined by the constraints of of um, the consensus. Um, that That's exactly what we've rebelled against all our lives. I mean, that was the spirit of the Enlightenment and so on. But it does come, we should recognize it comes at a cost, and you lose the comfort. It's in the same way that when we liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith in the Renaissance, we also liberate ourselves or we embrace the, the challenge of losing the comfort of, of, of faith. You know, um, you, know it, 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 you can't have it all. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the passage right, by definition, is an, an institution of conformity. I mean, it's it's a way of of saying, okay, you're no longer a child. You're part of the community. You're, you're, we now the community depends on you, and and you can't mess about. You can't screw it up. You know. So there's an element of kind of the tyranny of the community in that. But again, you get the comfort of of belonging to something bigger than oneself. You know, this is something we see, incidentally, in such an interesting way in hunting and gathering societies around the world. The community always has to triumph over the individual if anybody is going to survive. And so whether it's in the Arctic with the Inuit or the forests of Borneo with the nomadic Penan or the Athabascan peoples of, of northern British Columbia, hunting societies always favor the collective and, and 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 part of that is very simple if if you and i and your brother are a small extended family unit and i suddenly do don't get along with you michelle and uh, your brother sides with me and then we go off and you're left alone that night your children have a 66 percent less chance of eating right so in these societies there's a tremendous mm. um pressure. For example, in, in Nuptitak, the language of the Inuit, there are no swear words. They don't have them because that would be mm. so demeaning to people. If you disapprove, you simply are silent. In the Penan, there is no word for thank you because everything is automatically shared because you never know who will be the next to bring food to the table. And so there's a tremendous prohibition on wow. direct conflict. You know, I was once uh, in the Arctic about 250 miles out on the ice from Iglulik and we're in a huge blizzard and we got into this little shack they built an igloo for a couple people and there was a man and a woman who that night in the middle of the night in this blizzard howling had a fight and the woman was so mad she kicked a block of ice out of the igloo this was such a violent transgression of the mores of that society that that couple were so ashamed of themselves that they were gone by dawn because they felt they had embarrassed themselves in front of the whole group in that way. So you have this conformity that allows for cultural survival. And within that conformity, you can find comfort, but you can also feel oppressed by the power of the communal bond. It, it goes both ways. It's, it's so refreshing to hear different perspectives um, it brings back to me a, a memory. The first tour of Cirque du Soleil in Japan, um, 
so you know uh, at sick a lot of our artistic technicians they use the bikes to get to their uh, lodging in the in in the evening and and to to get to the site to the big top site uh, in the morning or afternoon so they always lock their bike uh, their bikes on the, on the fence that surrounds the the site and when they did that in Japan the japanese uh, people would would say like why are you locking your bike on a fence And the guys and girls would say, well, it's because we don't want to be stolen. And the Japanese went, we don't steal here. It would be a dishonor for us. We we don't go low like that. Really? So, and this this started to uh, let let their bicycle there. And, you know, and, and when we opened um, Zed, people at the first weeks were like, oh, my God, I forgot my wallet in, in the subway. And... and And Japanese would say, that's not a problem. What's what's wrong? Wow, I lost my wallet. It's not lost. Just go to that place. It will be there. Well, no, but someone probably uh, took my money. No, we would never, never do this. It would be a dishonor. So it was so... It, traveling is is essential to in our culture. But, and, but uh, you know, Michelle, that's a great example. It just exa gives us another dimension. Yeah, you know? but that's, a, that's also a great example because that is how the... In a sense, the power of the collective, if you will, works for the benefit of all in a place like Japan. But of course, it also means that if you go to Japan, um, you if you pay attention, um, you'll see that you know everything is ritualized. The, the 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 way you bow to someone signifies your status vis-a-vis -vis that person. You've often, I'm sure, been invited out as an honored guest. And you see around the table the poor underlings who all face two- and three-hour rides home on the Tokyo subway, but they have to stay until the dinner's over at midnight. Mm -hmm. And you can see the way that all of this, um, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> also can sort of spin into a, a – not a tyranny, but a, but a kind of a, a texture – that envelops the individual in traditions. Um, and, and, of course, that's the, whole, that's the whole experiment in the West is that, um, you, you know, we, we've not just um, eliminated uh, the sense of community, particularly in the United States, um, but we've almost eliminated the notion of society itself. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this is one of the things you're, you're seeing in the United States. I mean, I used to always say during the time of COVID, I wrote a piece for Rolling Stone um, th that I just, I just did it on a whim, but it went really viral and had 362 million social media impressions. It just it hit a nerve. Everybody was on edge, I guess, at that time. But one of the things I sort of said is, you know, if you want to understand the difference between Canada and the United States, just go and get your groceries at Safeway. And what I meant by that is if you get your groceries in the States, almost anywhere, there's a kind of an ethnic, educational, financial, economic, class, uh, racial divide between you and the checkout person, which is almost impossible to bridge, right? I think that is fair enough to say. And not that Canada is a perfect society by any means, but when you go to get your groceries in Canada, you don't really feel that divide in the same way. And the reason for that, I think, is that you know that the checkout person, and they know that you know, is getting a decent wage because of the unions. And probably because we're not quite so obsessed with private education, because these grocery stores are based in neighborhoods, there's a good chance that you know that the checkout person knows that you know that your kids probably go to the same public school, may have the same teacher. And third, and most essentially, that checkout person knows that you know that they know that you know that if your kids get sick and their kids get sick, they may have to wait in line like we all do in Canada, but we'll get the same treatment. And, and those three strands woven together become the sort of social fabric of, of, of social democracy. And, and that's why I think one of the things that people in the United States fail to understand about health care in particular is that it's not really about health. It's about social solidarity. It's about sending a message to everybody in the society that they count, that there's somebody. And I think if you try to understand why there is uh, demonstrably so much anger in the United States now, not just the left-right 
that you know democratic republican divide it's more than that there is just a, it's yeah. like a country ready to explode so i think you know a, a lesson in all of this uh, back to the theme of passage rights is that culture matters you know culture is not decorative uh it's not about just the clothes we wear, the prayers we utter, the songs we sing, the moves we make on the dance floor. Culture is basically about a body of ethical and moral values that every culture places around each individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us, sadly, lies within every human being. It, you know, it's culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, to find order and meaning in the universe, so that, as, uh, you know, to do as Lincoln said, seek the better angels of our nature. And when you lose the constraints of culture, um, then you get the points of violence and chaos and, and kind of almost degradation that we see all around us in the world. So, so I think that the passage rights are also about you know, educating the youth into the very mores and values of the society, uh, morals from God, ethics from humans, that allow us all as a social species to function. I mean, if you take the Ten Commandments, for example, uh, they, most cultures around the world would understand them all and embrace them all, not because the Judaic tradition, wondrous as it was, was uniquely inspired, but because those are the rules that allow a social species to function. I mean, I don't know any culture that tolerates murder or theft or doesn't have some notion of adultery um, uh, and so on. So, so that th these are the structures of our lives. And I think the passage right is, is partly a way of saying, you know, you are part of this structure, and now, in fact, not only are you part of it, you will be in charge of it, and 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 the entire fate of our people, our cultural survival itself, depends on both you understanding the importance of that, embracing it, and and then um, living it. I love that element of like the society telling the teenagers, well, "Now we need you." Absolutely. Imagine if we were saying that I collect, I have shivers because I'm just picturing when my kids will be that age, you know, I, I want to do a ritual custom made to them to say, okay, we need you. Imagine how empowering, you know, how there is the sense of responsibility instead of saying, like, oh my God, you're a burden, you know. Of course they do nothing. And I think, if I you think were just saying like, we respect you, we need you. Also, I think, you know, for example, when I was young, I used to be working for the parks and I would work with these youth crews. These kids would come to us from every social strata, every economic class all over the province of British Columbia. And they arrived in those work camps utterly kind of spoilt and brash and as, as obnoxious as a teenager can be because they were on edge, they were trying to impress everybody. And just through hard work and climbing mountains and creating challenges, it was like an initiation, you know, we, we took them up mountains, we made them work, we exemplified in our own labor uh -huh. what it meant to work, you know. And I remember when I was 15, you know, I, I was in the parks and there were all these forest fires and we were too young to fight them, They're, but they desperately needed the men, so they broke all those rules. I'll just never forget when an older wow. man said to me, here's a chainsaw, there's a forest fire 10 kilometers up that valley go find it. If you can build us a helipad, we might give you a ride out. Otherwise, you'll have to walk out. And by the way, here's a can of beans. See you later. And I just was like, wow. I just exploded with pride. It was like, you bet I'll put mm. the fire out. You know, and we did. We found it. We put <laughs> it out. And I came back another person. I was a different human being when I came back. And the thing is, it's not like these rights are imposed alone on teenagers or, or, or young people. No, young people that age are desperate for such yeah. rights. They want them. They want to be given responsibilities and chances to prove just how great they are. And if we don't give young people chances to do that in an institutional way, they'll find them on the streets. In cop, you, you see a lot of like risk taking. And, and you made me realize that when 
one of the reasons why we love, and I, I'm a, I have to disclose, I'm a huge fan of Cirque du Soleil. Although I work there, I'm still every day impressed and inspired. And, and a lot of it has to do, I think, by the fact that as a human being, you look at someone who will go to his or her limit. And really that, that, that liminal uh, 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 moment that you were talking about is that. They go like, they're about to do like, they do a one salto on the trapeze. Okay, that's one thing. And then, oh, can he do two saltos? And then th that moment, and you, you are with that person and you project your own uh, 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 life in, into that person. When that person succeeds it, you succeed. And I, I like to think that we, when we do a, a Cirque du Soleil show, we welcome people who have a collection of fears and, and, and limitations and worries. And when you have this moment where they all look at the acrobat m meeting his or her limit and going beyond that, then those individual fears and, and worries transform into one collective joy of, oh, wow, okay, that's, that's possible. And there's this empowerment uh, 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 moment that is so great. And so and, and what is great with Ka is that it does it with tableaus of acrobatics. It's not, there's, some, there's some acts, but there's also moments of really f big physicality but into a, a dramatic a context. There's the beautiful fight, a confrontation be between the good and the bad people, and they're just hanging on, on wires. And, and this, this was a rite of passage, actually, for Cirque du Soleil, because we wanted to challenge ourselves on, on the Vegas strip, because by then we had Mystère, we also had uh, O and Zumanity, and when that show came... We really made it very difficult for us. Robert's idea with Mark Fisher, the late Mark Fisher, the, mm. the incredible uh, set designer, they said, okay, let's, let's start by not having a stage. And, mm. you know, when you do acrobatics, the stage is the most important and safest thing. Let's, let's listen to that uh, clip from Ka. It's very important to safety uh, issues because just the forest scene, uh, most of them, they're on a the single point of failure. And this is what we would always want to avoid. We'd always want to have two point of failure. So if one fell, we always have a backup. In the forest scene, all of the artists are longe or attached. There's a rigor up there in the grid. But if the rigor makes mistakes or if the ropes get ripped, there's no net. Jacques, he brought all of his rigging team up there. He told them that one at a time, they will go take the position of the artist. When he did that, there was a couple of them that were freaking out. So he said, well, you guys are not going to be rigor from that part of that show. So that's, that's the way that, because he needed them to feel exactly what the artist will feel. So because they have a life at the end of their rope. So before, before I let you go, Wade, uh, can you talk about, a, well, you've done it, but if you have other personal rite of passage that you experience and what you learned in them and how it made you feel? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, what you were describing about the rigors is so interesting because in all of these um, traditional passage rites, in a way, the role of the rigor is played by the culture itself. You know, the... the um, um, the, 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 the boy is sent off into, into the wilderness on the vision quest. Well, people are waiting for him to come home. You know, the, the girl has her first um, menses, a period. She's put into the hut, but the mothers are waiting for her to come home. So there is, an, at least in a metaphorical sense, that same sense of, of mutual support. Um, and again, if, for example somebody embarks on a kind of shamanic initiation on their own, as I've had friends in uh, Western culture do. I actually had one friend who uh, had a kind of vision and um, uh, pursued what he thought was a revelation in a very serious way, months at a time in the wilderness alone, isolated in a hut the rest of the year. Um, pursuing this kind of um, spiritual uh, insight he had, he kind of created his own religion. Uh, and I, I once said to a professor at UCLA, a mentor of mine who was a, an authority on shamanism, I said, Johannes, let me tell you about someone. I'm not going to tell you what culture it's in. I'm just going to tell you what this character does in his kind of daily and monthly and annual devotions. And when I finished my account, 
Professor Wilbert said, that's a pure shamanic path. And the minute I explained who the individual was and where he was doing this, Professor Wilbert said, that's a recipe for psychosis. Because if you don't have a community to bring the vision back to, um, mm. it's very difficult. And I think that's something that happens in our culture. You know, if in, in, the, in the absence of formal rites of initiation, um, we go out and find them. I mean, in my case, uh, it was to go on the road to the Amazon. You know, when I think back to my first, you know, I left, um, uh, I left university when I was, I guess, 19 and spent a year and a half in the Amazon and, you know, living pretty intensely on the open road in South America. And at the time, I th didn't think of it this way, but in retrospect, it was a, absolutely was a passage right. I was I was giving myself the opportunity to succeed or fail. And at that time, uh, for those 15 months, I only had one word in my vocabulary for any new experience, and that was yes. I, I did, you know, I, I, I believed at that time that bliss was an objective state that could be achieved just by open yourself unabashedly to the world. And, and, and literally, I, I, um, I drunk, uh, and figuratively, and literally, I drank from every stream, including tire tracks in the road. And naturally, I was constantly sick with malaria and dysentery, and fevers that rose in the night and broke with the dawn. And I remember once even on a, on a, on a, on a day's notice, I embarked on a traverse of the notorious Darien Gap at the time a couple of hundred miles of swamp and rainforest, and I, I got lost for ten days with no food, and I mean it was really an extraordinary um, experience. When I finally arrived at the other end of it and got off a little plane in Panama, with only the rags on my back, uh, fungus growing all over my body, uh, uh, three dollars to my name, uh, 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 you know. I had nothing, but I had never felt so alive, you know. So, so I think we put ourselves through these um, passage rites, and 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 I think it's okay, but it'd be awfully nice to have a little bit of guidance. <laughs> it's funny because it, it, every time we speak, you always uh, uh, make me realize of, of memories that I just you know shoveled in, in, in my brain, and, and <laughs> when I when when I, I was. Uh, maybe 17 or 18, I decided to make a, a one-man show and to tour it. And I, I went to um, to a convention of French teacher, and I sold the show that didn't exist. And uh, they had told me, like, can you uh, present an excerpt? It was like three days later, and I said, yeah, 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 yeah. So I took something from Jacques Prévert, and I had like a little, little like lab jacket that I had, and an, uh, a, a, actually a clown nose, and I just made up something that I presented as a showcase of a show that does not exist, and I, I sold. I sold the show for a, 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 a mini tour. And incidents happened that I could not rehearse the show, and I had a... A, a friend of mine, and she would be the controlling of uh, the soundtrack that I did, you know, and stuff. And, and, uh, and here we are at eight in the morning. We have three performances because I had told the teachers I don't want to perform in a big uh, auditorium. I prefer to do for the same price three performances to three smaller groups. So we had 90, 90 audience members, never rehearsed the show, didn't even know the duration of the show. So we put ourselves into that, into that problem. And I remember because like we, we, we were supposed to arrive earlier, but the, the car lost a, a wheel. And it was, everything was happening. It, it was like epic. So we start the show, and I just look at her. I said, no, just follow me. My character will say music, and you just put the music on and stuff. We did the whole thing. It was exactly one hour and a half. And then clap, 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 ding, and the next group. And that, so I, I'm, just, I'm just realizing that... I, This was my rite of passage. Like, I want to make a show. If I can do this, then you know I will be fearless. But no one in well, you know, I think I think you know. I mean, I, I I I think that's you know one of the things I say to young people is uh, a couple of things that I've learned over the years. One is that creativity is not the motivation of action; it's a consequence of action. You have to do to create, <laughs> right? And secondly, for a young person. The most important thing is to be an opportunist, not in the sense of being a schemer, but to put yourself in the way of, op of opportunities in situations where there is no choice but success. 
and then you suddenly find yourself capable of doing things that would have been beyond your mm -hmm. imaginings a few weeks before. So if you think about it, Michelle, whether it's you having the audacity to put together that performance at that age in those circumstances, or my decision equally crazy, in a way equally bold and equally perhaps foolish or audacious to simply walk across 400 miles, 300 miles of swamp. I mean, what was I thinking, you know, but, <laughs> uh, but there you go. And that's what you do. It's amazing. Wait, I want to extend from the whole uh, community at Sud du Soleil, a huge, huge thank you. And from on the behalf of our listeners, it was such a pleasure. Thank you, Michelle, so much. I want to thank Way Davis, and I want to thank the whole team who's produced that podcast. To the listeners, I want to thank you for your presence. Join us for each episode as we delve into the themes and ideas that underpin Sig du Soleil's shows. Learn more about the roots of creativity and how to keep your eyes, mind, and heart open to new sources of creative inspiration. And remember, it can come from anywhere and anywhere. Thank you so much for listening to Sick to Sound. I am Michel Lapis. À la prochaine. Sick to Sound is produced by Sick du Soleil with technical and story production by Jar Audio. If you like what you heard today on Cirque du Sound, please subscribe, comment, and leave a review. 